Well, it is a delight to be with you all again. Um, since I am the Presbytery Executive and I have 50 churches and some new church developments in my flock, I never, ever get to preach two Sundays in a row in the same place. This is, you have no idea. I may just move in and you'll never get rid of me. Thank you <laughs> for this. Um, Dr. Raby invited um, myself and D Reverend Dr. Michael Wilson, the Presbytery Stated Clerk, to share a sermon series, which we cleverly and alliteratively have titled, So Far Learning with Lydia. Today is Journeying with Jonah. Michael will be with you for exulting in Ephesus and rumbling with Ruth. So, at that point, we have exhausted all the alliteration we know, so it's good it's only four weeks. As we turn to God's word, would you join me in prayer? Oh God, your word is a light to our feet, to our minds, to our eyes, to our hearts. Come and light us up so that we may eagerly receive your word and act upon it. In the name of Jesus, the living word, amen. So today we are going to journey with Jonah. And Jonathan very kindly gave me my little gizmo, and we could put the first image up right now. Um, we are going actually to be traveling through the entire book of Jonah, which is a sermon unto itself. So let us listen for God's word. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, get up and go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, if I were not looking for alliteration in journeying with Jonah, the title of this sermon would be Jonah, the world's worst evangelist. So here we've got Jonah. This is from a mosaic in St. Mark's Basilica. And you can see that Jonah is not the most cheerful of guys. Um, Jonah, uh, the book itself was written um, during the time that the Hebrew people had gone into exile. And it actually received rive circulation after they came back to Jerusalem. And it is a book that is filled with humor. By the end of Jonah, we are meant to be looking in the mirror of this world's worst evangelism in order to be motivated to be different. I have just given away the punchline of this, but um, I, you need to get it the whole way through. Jonah is a bad evangelist. So, in fact, Jonah is um, in his little town. Jonah, um, the name really is like Joe. This is Joe Jonah. And Jonah, son of Amittai, they think that maybe he would have been a laborer of some sort. He was not a scholar. So let's imagine Jonah, he is holding up his favorite bar stool at the end of the bar where he goes for happy hour every night and he is scarfing down the peanuts and he is waiting to see how the Phillies are doing. That is Jonah. 
And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And the word of the Lord says to Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh, that great city. And Jonah is um, not very far away from Joppa there. So you can see that Nineveh is that away. And Jonah decides to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now, even a not very religious guy like Jonah is going to know Psalm 139, which says, where can I go from your presence? Where could I flee? Wherever I go, you're there. So this is a journey that is doomed to failure. But nonetheless, Jonah being told to go to Nineveh sets off for Tarshish absolutely as far away as he could go. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and a mighty storm came up on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. And the sailors were afraid, and each of them cried out to his God, and they threw out the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it from them. But Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship, and he had lain down and was fast asleep. And the captain came and he said to him, Jonah, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call upon your God. Perhaps your God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. Well, see, the sailors... We've learned a lot about them in that little passage. The sailors are religious. Jonah's not. He is down asleep in the hold of the sea. Jonah would rather go down with the ship than go to Nineveh. Jonah is asleep. All of the sailors are praying each to their own gods. And the thing is, um, each of the sailors would have been from a different region, that Mediterranean basin, and each of those regions had its own god. So they are really doing dial a god. They are trying to find the right god who has caused this storm to come up. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea again. And the sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. And the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to Jonah, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? Of what people are you? Who is your God? And Jonah said, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the sailors were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because Jonah had told them so. So apparently they're all sitting around at night playing poker, and Jonah says to them, I'm fleeing for the presence of the Lord. That's a great way to introduce yourself. And the sailors said to him, what shall we do to you so that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing ever more and more tempestuous. And he said, pick me up and throw me in the sea, for then the sea will quiet down. For I know it is because of me that the Lord has provided this great wind and has provided the storm that has come upon you. But nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the storm back to land, the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew ever more and more tempestuous against them. And then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray. Do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of the innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as pleased you. So they picked Jonah up, and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared Lord, the Lord even more, 
and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. So the sailors are far more devout than Jonah. And a little byproduct of Jonah's journey to try to get to Tarshish actually has it that the word of the Lord that has come to Jonah, so Jonah is a prophet. If you are a prophet, you have the word of the Lord. And Jonah has spoken the word of the Lord to the sailors, and they convert. Jonah can't help himself. The sailors, you can imagine the vows they're making. I will never cheat on my wife again. I will quit putting fake measures in the grain. You have an entire ship full of converted, devout sailors and one very unhappy Jonah. So the Lord provided. The Lord has provided a great wind. The Lord has provided a storm. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, while Jonah is in the belly of the fish, he prays a psalm of thanksgiving. It is the entire chapter of Jonah 2. Jonah is only three chapters long. And you can go and read it for yourself. Um, Jonah is talking about being in the depths of Sheol, but as his life is ebbing away, God has provided for him. And it ends with Jonah saying, with the voice of thanksgiving, saying, Hallelujah, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance prolongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, in the second service, the kids will be helping me. And a reason for that is in order to understand the glory of this giant fish spewing Jonah out on the dry land, you need the fourth grade male to help you enact it. <laughs> there is no way that we could do it justice. So the giant fish spews Don Jonah out onto the dry land. And Jonah, who has been swearing that with a grateful word he will deliver because salvation responds to the Lord, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time and says, Jonah... Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the command of the word of the Lord. Now Jonah was an exceedingly large city, three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. Now, do the math with me for a minute. If you, imagining Nineveh as a great city, where would you expect to find the king in the center of government? Right in the center of the city. So, if you are a prophet and you are commanded to go and speak the word that God has commanded, how far would you have to go to get to the center of the city if it's a three days journey across? A day and a half. Jonah goes a day's journey. He doesn't even want to spend the night heading into the city. So Jonah climbs up on the world's tiniest soapbox. Right at the end of the day's journey, wherever he is, he sets up his little, little crate and steps up on it, and he preaches his sermon. He preaches, 40 days no more and none of it will be overthrown. End of sermon. Now, in the English, this is an eight-word sermon. 
40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I am not a Hebrew scholar, but I am told that in the Hebrew it is five words. It is the world's shortest sermon. And then Jonah goes out to the edge of town, but the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth, and when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. Now, if we need the fourth grade nail to help us with the spewing out of Jonah, then we need the fourth grade female to help us with how do you put sackcloth on animals, on a cow? Do you um, just put, drape it over their back? Do you make holes for all the hooves? How do you do it? This is quite remarkable. Everyone is in sackcloth and ashes, but the people were repenting even before the word reached the king, and then he made the proclamation. Now see, the reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is that it was the Ninevites who came in and conquered Israel and they slaughtered almost everybody, 90%. But they took 10% of the people as a tribute back to Nineveh, to the capital. And they led them out, it tells us, with fish hooks. In other words, one person had a fish hook put through their tongue, and that was tied to a rope to the person in front of them. And this entire procession with fish hooks through the tongue, men, women, children, was the horror that had happened to the Israelites. So this puts a bit of a different cast on it, why Jonah doesn't want to go and preach anything to Nineveh, and why he delivers his message so grudgingly. And so when God saw what they did, and how they changed their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that was to be visited upon them, and God did not do it. But Jonah, this is very displeasing to Jonah, and he becomes very angry. He prays to the Lord and said, "'O oh Lord, is not this what I said was in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life away from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord, who is the world's greatest spiritual director in this story, the Lord calmly asked Jonah a question. The Lord asks, Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there, and he sat under it in the shade, waiting 40 days to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God <coughs> appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah, to give him shade over his head, the Lord provided a bush to save him from discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God provided a worm 
that attacked the bush so that it withered. Get it? It withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a sultry east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faked and asked again to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, I am angry enough to die. Now, to get the feel of this, um, have any of you ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> this is the place where you take your children and your grandchildren and you dump the entire contents of your bank account out on a table and it is converted to tokens and your cherished little ones, they feed these tokens into machines and they get about a bazillion tickets, thousands of them, and then they go and they trade in all these tickets and they get a glow necklace. That is what happens at Chuck E. Cheese. You could buy the same necklace for a quarter at the dollar store. Well, if you ever end up there, steal some of their tokens and go find the game that has the alligators. And these alligators stick their snouts out and you have to bang the snout of the alligator. It's great for getting out aggression. You just bang the alligator. When I'm with churches where they're fighting and the session is all upset, I tell them they need to get this alligator game and everybody in the church just needs to bang the alligator for a while. They would get along much better. So you bang the snout of the alligator and if you make it through round one with enough snout pounds, then it the, goes to round two and the alligator at the top turns on this red light and yells, now I'm angry. That's Jonah. Jonah is angry. <coughs> and Jonah is all messed up. He is angry because the bush has withered. And then God quietly, quietly God says, Jonah, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And then comes what Northrop Frye, that great literary critic, once called the greatest run-on sentence in all of literature. It is, and should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city filled with 120,000 souls who do not know their right hands from their left and also much cattle. Jonah is a prophet. And when he preaches his sermon, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown, that isn't even the word that the Lord gave to him because Jonah knows that God is merciful and slow to anger and quick to relent, God, Jonah knows the mercy and the grace of God, and he doesn't want to tell it to the Ninevites. So, dear friends, this is a mirror held up to us. And by the time we get to the end of the story, we don't need a sermon. All we need are a few questions. The word of the Lord is coming to you right now right here in the middle of your busy weekend getting ready for Memorial Day weekend the word of the Lord is coming to you with the message of God's grace what Nineveh are you commanded to go to you'll know it because it's the one you don't want to go to where is it that God's grace in this world is needed and the word of the Lord is provided to you to go and proclaim it, to go and act it out in little ways or big. What person do you need to go and speak a word of reconciliation even though they were in the wrong and you are in the right and you will swear that's true until the day you die? What place in your workforce needs some sense of light and a new beginning? What place in this world, in this city, needs what only you can provide, you'll know it because you don't want to do it. The word of the Lord comes to you, and if you don't want to go, God is going to show up in your light, 
and over and over again, is it so, right to be so angry? Is it right not to go? Is it right to hold that grudge? Is it right not to get over it? Over and over again, the word of the Lord will show up until finally you, along with God, can say, yes, I am concerned for Nineveh, that great city. For the 120,000 souls, even though they don't know their right hands from their left, and even if they're a lot like cattle, yes, I will go. Amen.